scientists. Uh, there are a lot of uh, cheat and emotions are generated. People are very upset that, you know, we use like animals for research and there are a lot of resistance to them. Some of them are justified, some of them are exaggerated. People are start asking questions like, uh, are there uh, good alternatives or do we have to really use animals or continue to do something else, kind of. Do animal models adequately represent human disease? It's a very relevant question. Now, this kind of thing which we will talk about it today. Are these animals well cared for? Are your experiments ethical? Uh, are you under regulation to do all these activities? So these are the type of questions people start asking. Now, we have a responsibility to the society to convince them that what we are doing is really important and what we are doing is really useful to uh, the humankind. What is an animal model? I'm broadly defining what animal model is. Uh, here, the, an animal with the disease, which, which could be same as a human disease, or it must very much similar to what humans have, and uh, it is used to study the development and progression of diseases and to test new treatments for clinical use. This is broadly a definition of animal model. That means the model should represent a disease or a human disease for which uh, you want to understand the basic biology of that and try to find the new treatments uh, for this disease. For that, this model should be faithfully be useful. Now, is that happening? Uh, broadly, there are a lot of animals, varieties of animals are used in research, mouse, rat, hamsters, guinea pigs, rabbits, and so on. But uh, the, the smaller rodents, particularly the mouse and rats, uh, play a very major role because if you see the animals use, the quantum of animals use, more than 95% of animals use uh, come from this category, mouse and rats. So we will look at them because uh, we have a lot of background data available, and so it's much easier for us to take it forward in this task of looking for good animal models. What should be the characteristic of an ideal animal model? Obviously, the disease it represents should be having high similarity to the human condition. Pathophysiologically, it should resemble the human disease. The phenotypical and histopathological characteristics should obviously be the same as that of the humans. And more importantly, they should also have predictive biomarkers for prognosis of the disease and also the way how the model respond to therapy should be also be translated in human. And it also should have uh, use in safety and toxicity assessment. This is a, it's a very tall order, but many animal models will not uh, fulfill all this. Let's take the example of, let's say, as a, uh, as a model, lab mouse. It's one of the most commonly used uh, animal in the laboratory. If you see grossly, the anatomically, there are a lot of resemblances, anatomical, cellular, and even molecular similarities. We have lungs, heart, liver, kidneys, as they have in humans, so there are a lot of similarities. But more importantly, the small size, the short generation time, and ease of maintenance, that made the mouse much more popular because it's easy to study large number of animals with the least expense of uh, resources. And so there's really a uh, lot of information is available in this model. A lot of research is being carried out in this model. Let's look at the, uh, the, the genetic relationship between mouse and man. Because if you expect the mouse to represent man, at genomic level, there should be similarities. And that seemed to be so very well. For example, the uh, man and mouse share a common ancestor in the evolution in 80 billion, million years ago. And the genomes of both these, both man and mouse, have about uh, 3 billion base pairs, the genomic information. Out of that, only 5% is only a coding region. In that uh, aspect, both of them are very similar. When we examine the varieties of genes in these animals, uh, the studies have been done for around 4,000 or so the genes. In the study, they found that almost all of them are similar in both the cases. Either you have a similar gene in the mouse or they have a, what we call uh, a equivalent gene which performs similar biological function. 
uh, only around 10 they found uh, 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 genes which are slightly different from in this 40 genes which were studied. The protein coding regions are also 85% identical in these uh, two species. And some genes are about 90% identical, meaning there's a very good similarity between the two species. And by genomics, mutations in human disease can be introduced into mice genome that gives a good opportunity to make the mouse somewhat similar to man wherever there are differences. Now that is where the new technology is taking us forward. If we look at animal models in drug research, we use them mostly to in the new therapeutic agent when you develop. There are three aspects we are interested in. Uh, safety, pharmacokinetics, and efficacy. So the, uh, we are more concerned with efficacy. The rest of them I will not really discuss today. And there are what we call a go or no go decisions in the industry uh, based on animal studies to go for clinical trials. And that is where we find your animal models are critically involved. But there are a lot of disappointments here. This is very briefly the uh, drug discovery and development activities where we have a basic research, going to preclinical development, clinical trials, and uh, going for FDA approval or drug regulatory approvals. In the preclinical development, the uh, whole animals are used because the whole animals will uh, be able to, you will be able to show the absorption distribution, metabolism related things. There will be uh, drug metabolism related studies can be done. In, in vivo toxicity can be done plus the, the pharmacologic actions, which uh, helps to uh, cure the disease also can be studied here. It's a very expensive process. And if the errors are made here, it's going to cost uh, enormously to the industry. Let me very briefly uh, tell you what kind of uh, uh, cost involved in this uh, predictivity. The cost of developing a new drug takes around 2.5 billion US dollars, is one of the recent estimates. The pivotal clinical trials use around 19 million uh, dollars. We see the failure rates. The clinical trial failure rates or success rate we see in ophthalmological products around 30%, cardiovascular drugs around 25%, infectious diseases 25%, oncology is much poor, hardly 3% or 5%. Only you find success rate. Now that is a very, uh, very, very uh, unfortunate situation. Now, what we call this translational problem. Why are these problems? The process of getting drugs to market is getting longer, costlier, and riskier. But if you see the uh, literature uh, uh, in one of the reviews, found that uh, a review of animal studies published in seven leading scientific journals. In these journals, the median citation count was around 889. Only one third could be translated into human trials. The safety is something very seriously wrong. They are all very highly esteemed the journals. Uh, the people who publish are they're very you know, competent. But in spite of all this, only one third of these findings could be really translated to uh, clinical effectiveness. And more importantly, about one tenth only, one tenth of the study only resulted in drug products. That means very, very high failure rates. So it seems there's a need for a relevant, carefully designed, well characterized animal model, which will have a good predictive value from lab to the clinical science. You can broadly divide these uh, reasons for these failures into those which are what we call the logical design related issues and fundamental differences between man and animal in what we call the species differences. If you look at the, uh, the difficulty in translatability, a whole lot of them have been also assigned to the way the studies are carried out. The research methodology was not really adequate. There are several reviews of this nature. They found that the quality of animal cues is very poor. Their husbandry was very poor. For example, if you are studying uh, for an effect, uh, effective drug, let us say for a, a liver ailment, if the animal is already suffering from liver infection, you cannot really expect a good response. 
do an experimental design. You know, do, do not have a very good controls. Unsupported studies, meaning the sample size has been very poor so that you do not uh, identify a true difference when there is a difference existed. Poor study protocols, lack of blinding and so on. So there are many experimental problems have been uh, assigned to these failures. And inappropriate data analysis and misuse of statistics is all quite common. And they have generally found that the the methodologies employed in preclinical versus clinical research seem to be very much different in the sense in clinical research there are a lot of blinding goes on, for example. In preclinical, we don't have, do not have any blinding. For instance, if we are measuring a, a clinical response in the animals, uh, the investigator is not blinded to uh, which is the control group, which is the test group, and so on. There are several failed therapies. I thought I will take, for example, there are two, three which are very prominently discussed in these days. I'll choose one of them, which is involving the acute ischemic stroke, where a drug, what we call NXY059, was studied, both in animals and humans. And let's look at in detail what went wrong with this. We are all quite familiar with the acute ischemic stroke. The stroke is a serious condition, there's a medical emergency with high mortality. About 20% of the people die within a month. And half of those who survive are left with a physical disability. Obviously, it's a very uh, serious clinical condition. We need good therapies. Currently, therapy involves uh, thrombolysis with alteplase. But still, there is a need for a very effective uh, treatment. In the in acute ischemic stroke, you find that there is a, a central core of ischemic core where there are dead tissues and pop tissues, which cannot be revived. But on the periphery, over, we got what is called the penumbra. Now, this is, this is available for a rescue. Uh, before the tissues completely die, you can revive them, and that will be a good improvement in uh, clinical condition. Now, people have studied uh, the, what are the various mechanisms involved in this tissue damage during this year. And pre-radical generation was uh, considered to be one of the important mechanisms though there are other mechanisms as well. Well, this is a compound they found that is capable of uh, trapping uh, the prey radicals, so they thought it should work. So they studied it on a model, what is called the model of middle cerebral artery occlusion. This model, very briefly, is, is done on anesthetized rats, and uh, you replicate the conditions of human pathology by blocking the middle cerebral artery in a reversible way. You use an intraluminal suture technique to uh, push a, a suture into the uh, middle cerebral artery under experimental conditions. It's a little tricky and uh, tough uh, procedure. Uh, in fact, I remember in Torrent when we tried to set up this model, there were a lot of mortality and so on. But the model works very well uh, in the sense that once you complete your model successfully, you could show very clear uh, signs and symptoms, uh, just like uh, human uh, stroke. Uh, in this model, MCA model, uh, there are two ways you can do the occlusion. Either it could be a transient occlusion or a permanent occlusion. To, uh, to replicate what happens clinically, you can do a neurological assessment 24 hours after the start of reperfusion and also do a histological assessment of the infarct volume. So you are able to capture the, the pathology of uh, the stroke of animals. Uh, of humans in this model very well. When they did the study, they found that uh, the impact volume was very much, you know, uh, reduced by the test drug. You know, there was a dose-related response, which in pharmacology we considered is a very important evidence. As the dose increases, the level of impact volume decreases, means there is a protection. Uh, there was also a relationship between the concentration of the drug in the blood versus the uh, decrease in POC volume. So there are also a, a good evidence that the uh, drug is working very well. Uh, the neurological score also there is an improvement. In all the three doses, there was a, a significant uh, difference. So in, 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 total, in total, it appeared that the drug is working very well in a model 
which very much resembles a human stroke, uh, the drug is able to rescue the tissue as well as the functions. So people went on to do a clinical study. In fact, uh, there were several studies have been done. I would like to highlight just one of them. What is called the SAINT-2 study. Uh, because the SAINT-1 study was in pure patients. Now, this was done on a large number of patients of acute ischemic stroke. Uh, they have done a perfusion of the drug for about 72 hours or a placebo within six hours of onset of stroke. So in clinically, a patient when he's had a, a stroke, it takes at least a few hours for him to get to the hospital. So to replicate that, they had to do the study uh, in the same way. And the endpoints were disability scores of what is called a modified ranking scale of 90 days after the uh, stroke uh, condition so that they could see how much of neurological deficit uh, existed with the treated and unpleasurable groups. And also what is the severity of the stroke. For that they used what is called the NIH uh, stroke scale. The, the study broadly showed this is an odds ratio of uh, some of these uh, parameters we were compared. If, uh, uh, based on the study it was found, uh, if the odds ratio is shifted more on this side, it's close to two, then you would expect your test drug is working. Whereas in this case, you find most of them are in the midline or close to the placebo, showing that there were hardly any uh, improvement. They concluded in this study that there was no benefit on ranking scale and the secondary endpoints by treating with their patients with uh, the NHY. The mortality was the same, almost the same in both the groups. So they concluded that uh, NHY was ineffective in the treatment of acute ischemic stroke. Now, this is a serious disappointment. On one hand, we show in animal models that it works very well, but in patients, this drug doesn't seem to work. Now, there's another uh, example I would like to say. This is a much more aggressive example in the sense that these authors, they virtually against animal experiments. Now, this is a doctor. Shaw Warren is a uh, uh, researcher at the Massachusetts General Hospital. He's also in professor of pediatrics at the Harvard Medical School. And he and his colleagues, they studied the genomic, res the, uh, genomic responses uh, for inflammation uh, in both in, anim in, in mouse as well as in humans. What they did was this. Their study was published uh, sometime in 2013. Well, they concluded that the mouse models poorly mimic the human inflammatory diseases based on the, the genes which are activated during these conditions. So that is a very fundamental to say the pathology seems to be quite different. It's a little uh, involved uh, study, uh, but I've just taken one graph to uh, emphasize the point. What they had done was, they had looked at the around, around 4,000 or 5,000 human genes and compared them with the mouse genes uh, or orthologs of the mouse genes in, uh, as a response to trauma, burns, or endotoxemia, three different conditions. In all, there is an inflammatory response. To their surprise, they found that if you compare the genes which are uh, uh, activated, in, in the human bone versus the human there's a good relationship. You, you see, this is a scattered plot, uh, and they also worked out what is called the correlation uh, coefficient, the R squared value, for these two comparisons to around 0.91. What it really means is that the type of genes which are activated or inhibited here is the same or very similar to what happened during trauma. But if we compare that with, let's say, mouse bone with the human bone, you see this is the graph, corresponding graph for these two comparisons. Human bone versus the mouse bone. Here, the values are all scattered all over the place. There is no good correlation. If you look at the value, there's a 0 0.08 is R squared. So they concluded in this study, they say that the, the murine genomic response is completely different from that of humans. So they are saying, then why are we studying this in mouse if they want to translate this data to a response? 
uh, they the in this study they concluded that they they made an observation that there has been no systematic studies evaluating how well the murin models may be human implemented diseases there nobody has done it and they say they are the first one to have done this study in fact it is a, a multi uh, laboratory several labs collaborated and they did it of course this paper created a lot of controversies there are several uh, subsequently several others have supported and uh, questioned their conclusions, but some of their conclusions are really very interesting. They said that although the acute inflammatory stress from different etiologies result in, in uh, human genomic responses, which were all similar, but if we compare them with mouse, the responses are very different. And they said that among the genes which change significantly in humans, most of the laws are close to random in matching their human counterparts, meaning there is no relationship between the uh, response, the genomic response for inflammation initiated by three different models, that is bone, the uh, injection of uh, endotoxins, or by trauma. Uh, there is a completely uh, different response between these two species. Now, they go on to even say further, comment on that. They say the most models have dominated our scientific literature for a while now. They said we have to probably look at, have a relook at this. Now, this is, can we assume most models developed to mimic human disease translate directly to human conditions? If these are the type of findings we have. Now, similar studies have been done for other diseases. That's the type of question they're asking. And what they're recommending is that we have to focus more on complex human conditions and study them in at a genomic level rather than relying on most models. In fact, they are they are saying that it's really not really worthwhile to study this in the most models. Oh, that's a very serious uh, serious allegation. They recommend several new approaches. The new approaches are like this. They say that we have to comprehensively describe human diseases at the genomic level to begin with. And if you are developing a model, the disease altered pathways should be similar to what you see in human, then only these models can be really accepted as good models. And we have to determine how will the model reproduces human disease on molecular basis and not by simple phenotypes. And uh, they recommend that uh, development of synthetic human models in vitro, meaning now there are uh, new methods are coming up like uh, uh, three-dimensional uh, cell cultures or organ on chip. Of those kind of methods, they feel, will give much more reliable information than looking at animal models. And they even recommend that after this in vitro uh, proof of uh, concept, we should directly go for clinical studies rather than going to animal models. Now, that brings up uh, to the type of new model which you can, you know, introduce human characteristics into animals. Now, one of them, one such attempt is to make what is called the xenograft model. In the xenograft model, the principle is, is, a, is a very simple, though it's very difficult to do. You take a patient's tumor in sort of uh, cell lines from the, from the lab. The, the source is actually for the tumor is less, the uh, tissue is a patient tumor. You transplant them into an animal, in this case, a new mouse, which is uh, immune deficient. Uh, unless the animal is immune deficient, it, you can't transplant them because they, it will be rejected by the mouse. And in this model, you can allow the tumor to grow and you can investigate on the growth uh, curve whether this can be inhibited by a, a test drug and so on. So it's a very interesting model because here what you are studying is actually a human tissue, though it is in, in an animal. So all the responses, all the uh, pathology, the, the genomic uh, mechanisms involved will be very similar to what happens in human. That is the idea. And that seemed to have uh, picked up very well. In the last 20 years, you find several groups have started working on such models. Now, in the, in the initial study, these people, how they validated this whole method is that when they did the study, they found that if you take the standard of care or the uh, currently used to, anti-cancer drugs, they compared that between patients and the xenograft model, there was 90% agreement in remissions of cancer. And wherever they found resistance in around 59 patients, 
In 50s and xenographs also they found similar resistance. There was a 97% agreement. You see, this kind of agreement has never been obtained for our for conventional anti-cancer studies. So they felt that this may be a good model to go forward. But what they had done was they were only for drugs which were already been proved to be having anti-cancer effect. So this has to be proved for new, new compound, what we call the new chemical entities. This again, once again, uh, this schematically is the same uh, uh, mechanism. We see that you take the tissue from a, a patient, uh, grown on a, a, a nude mouse, and expand them into two or three generations. And when you follow the growth curve across time, if you have a particular test drug, the test drug might inhibit, whereas in the vehicle group, the tumor keeps growing. So this is a very interesting model where you introduce the human characteristics into this uh, animal model. Well, there are certain details that I would like to skip at this stage. Only I would like to say that what we have introduced in this model is certain uh, human characteristics into uh, the animal model, and the response seems to be uh, very, very efficient and very uh, highly predictable. The other, another set of uh, uh, model, what we call the humanized mouse model, and this concept is also very interesting. In this, what is done is that the uh, the mouse is being uh, in the mouse to introduce human tissues uh, and to make it resemble the human response. Now the principle is that if you look at the mice directly uh, as a comparison with humans, you find that there are very clear differences in immunological aspects. So the, the general concept is that the mouse is very different immunologically from humans. For example, the tall leg receptor 10, uh, the functional tall leg receptor 10 is absent in, in mice, which is present in humans. Similarly, there is an absence of expression of uh, TLR 11, 12, and 13. These are some of the components of your immunology, which you find in humans, they are absent in mice. And so it's believed that uh, as far as immunology is concerned, the mice will always respond differently as compared to humans. But many pathogens are species specific. It may be human specific. They may not work very well in the mouse unless you introduce the conditions or the tissues of a human into this mice model. So these are uh, basically done on what we call the uh, immunocompromised animals, where they have a, these animals have a, uh, a mutation of what we call the IL-2 receptor gamma chain uh, mutation. This makes this animal extremely immunodeficient. They don't have NK cells, they don't have uh, T cell function, they don't have B cell function, and so they are virtually uh, deficient of uh, immunity. In this, you can introduce human tissues like liver, skin, or even uh, uh, cancer tissues and uh, humanize these models by introducing these tissues. And so these models uh, respond like humans. Now, this kind of models are used very much in human infectious diseases, regenerative medicine, uh, graft versus host diseases, allergies, which are all specific to humans. Uh, for example, allergies is very difficult to replicate in, in animals. Now, for such studies, these such models are really very useful, found to be very predictive. Now, this describes how we generate such uh, uh, engraftment. Uh, uh, this model, particularly this QSRC skid model, it has got an immune system very much similar to that of human. It's a complete human immune system has been introduced into this mouse. And these models are very uh, predictive of what happens in certain uh, human specific diseases, like infectious diseases including HIV, dengue, dengue virus, Epstein Barr virus, many infections which are very specific to humans. Now, these animals uh, respond in the same way because of the similar immune function. In oncology, uh, tumor growth uh, and cancer immunology, they are all very similar to what you see in humans. They are also used as a model for transplant plantation related studies. Uh, autoimmune diseases like, for example, systemic lupus erythematosus, arthritis, ulcerative colitis, uh, such models are available in humanized models. And it's believed that uh, evaluation of drugs and identification of underlying mechanisms in a broad range of diseases which are human-specific 
can be studied in this model. They are much more suitable. Thirdly, another uh, class of uh, molecules, uh, uh, class of uh, models, what we call the genetically engineered mouse models. Uh, these models are generated by a recombinant uh, uh, technology, and you can introduce a specific human genes into these animals, and so they're genetically modified. In the earlier case, we introduced the tissues and cells. Here, we directly deal with the uh, genes themselves. There are two classes of models. So in one case, use embryonic based models, and another one, what we call the gene editing using what's called the CRISPR Cas9 technology. Now, this technology has completely revolutionized how you can introduce a transgene into an experimental animal. Uh, virtually every uh, genetic alteration found in human tumors can be introduced into an animal by this kind of technology. Now, this broadly says uh, how the whole procedure is done is a is a is a recomb by recombinant technology. In the upper panel, talks shows the embryonic uh, uh, stem cells are used, where you after after creating your genetic uh, damage or genetic uh, modifications, you introduce them into blastocysts and uh, implant them in, in a pseudo-pregnant uh, animals to generate chimeric mice which carry this uh, change in human gene. In the Cas9, there are two types of models. In one case, you use transgenic Cas9 expressing animals. In one case, in the second case, you develop uh, tumors entirely based on uh, the human genes. Now, such genetically modified models have been shown to be useful in several varieties of investigations. Now, these investigations have high level of uh, high level of uh, predictability for human conditions. And also, you can use these models to study a variety of uh, basic cancer research, for example, identifying a cancer gene or uh, what is the cells of origin for a particular uh, tumor and so on. So these models are slowly uh, coming up into use though they are very expensive and we are difficult to uh, prepare. After seeing all these technological, uh, highly advanced models, I'm also struck by a very interesting model, what we call the zebra fish. It is such a simple model, but it has offered a lot of new information and it also offers a large scale screening of uh, big libraries of chemicals. So it's very important for the industry. If you see the interest on zebra fish in the last 15, 20 years, see the number of publications. There's a tremendous increase in this model uh, using zebra fish as a cancer model. And it's got certain specific uh, advantages. Now, in the zebra fish, for example, they are being used for screening large chemical libraries for uh, general drug toxicity as well as uh, uh, gross developmental abnormalities. Now, then after this initial screening, they can take enough for a further preclinical model. So it's a very important step where you, you screen thousands of compounds and identify one or two to take for preclinical studies. So that's a big advantage to the industry, which will improve the predictive value of uh, your uh, process. Interestingly, the uh, zebra fish embryos, they are transparent, and so you can make a direct observation of the cancer formation and its progression. And there are techniques which are, are available where you can fluorescently label these cancer cells, inject into the, the zebra fish, and the cell proliferation can be monitored by live cell microscopy. It's done in the whole animal when it's alive. So it's a very interesting technique, and it gives a lot of important, useful information. And more importantly, the short time frame for xenotransplantation, meaning if you used to do, if you remember the earlier model which I talked about, the uh, uh, patient-derived genograms in mouse, sometimes it takes even a couple of months for the tumor to grow, whereas here, it, the tumor grows within a few days. So there's a lot of advantage in terms of time. And it's emerging as a versatile model for the study of human cancers. I'll just give you one graph to show that. You see, this was published sometime uh, about five years back. Uh, this is a picture uh, showing the varieties of cells cancer cells which are being implanted for saying cancer uh, related uh, studies, as well as uh, xenografts, the, all these um, 
marked by uh, by bold letters these are the attempts on uh, studying this this model for studying uh, uh, cancer so this appears to be a very interesting model so these are the uh, mix of uh, models which are coming up in the recent days to uh, avoid the problem to increase the predictability and so on but how do we really validate a model now this science is really not very well developed though many people have talked about it there hardly any literature is available uh, uh, winner in 1984 started what is called an external validity or animal model and he based it on the psychiatric field more he was a psychiatry basically and brought in three three functions uh, or three components uh, for validating animal model predictive validity phase validity and concept validity and uh, it appears that uh, not one single model can uh, satisfy the conditions all the three they might probably will have to use a group of models and the predictive validity is supposed to be the most important of all now what is this uh, criteria as i said the predictive validity phase validity and construct validity the predictive validity refers to how well a model predicts currently unknown aspects of a disease in humans meaning suppose this model shows a biomarker it should be possible for you later on to investigate and identify similar marker in humans that is the level of predictivity of this model or a particular drug works in this model and the same drug should work in this model that refers to the predictive validity the phase validity talks about the how phenotypically these models resemble each other probably is not of much validity the concept validity talks about how well the mechanism used to induce a disease in the model has similarity to that of humans so if they have a similarity that means the predictive validity will automatically will be higher that is the concept now depending on each of these criteria an optimum combination of models could be selected now these are the type of criteria people are talking about but hardly any uh, studies have been done to validate these models uh, most of the models which we are using currently they are all available for us to uh, work uh, work and find out how well these models are uh, Uh, pretty having predictive value and how many of them are not useful to us and so on so that will change the way we look at the new drug discovery and development uh, what i'm saying in 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 a nutshell is that the animal model story is getting more and more complex the many model which we are using currently may not be very relevant we have to always be alert to this fact that this model may not be relevant to what you were studying you have to very critically try to evaluate your model and this whole science of validating the model is undergoing a lot of change and uh, development is a good opportunity for us to work on such a study i'd like to say only uh, close my talk by saying that what is the future of this animal model if this is the situation what do you think will happen somebody have predicted i put in a graph here see in the in the current period most of the studies if you see the volume of studies in the rat very large but in the humans much less and what is predicted there by 2000 2050 people will be working more on man rather than animal more that is the type of predictions people are making so these are the changes that are likely to come in the days to come because we are trying to introduce all the human characteristic in your screening methods or even in vitro methods and probably altogether avoid animal models there to and on the top of it we have increased the pressure to reduce use of animals so see the immutable models like organon chip which shows which uh, has got a three dimensional architecture where several cells of a particular organ can be grown and allow to mimic the human function is a total immutable similarly organized with three dimensional self organizing microphysiological systems which very much resemble human organ function so such models or in vitro models will faithfully will predict what will happen in human and go directly to human study rather than going through the animal model that's the kind of things people are considering and also if you see currently there is a the way you test a new drug we have phase 1 phase 2 phase 3 clinical trials uh, we start with phase 1 where you look at the safety right now currently people have brought in different kind of a phase, uh, clinical trial called phase 0 clinical trial 
in the phase zero clinical trial, you start with a dose of a drug much, much smaller than to bring in any biological effect, you know, but still you can study the kinetics and so on and slowly raise this concentration of the dosage, uh, carefully monitoring what is happening to the, uh, the safety aspects uh, for this drug. Uh, so the phase zero kind of trials can be done if you have enough in vitro data probably you may not need clinical data, the lab animal uh, uh, model data so these are the type of things which are happening we should be uh, allowed to this fact i would like to conclude by saying that this whole area of animal model which is undergoing change there are uh, you know validation of these models new, developing new models comparing the model with that of human disease and so on it's a great area for us to work on. I'm sure many of you will be interested to uh, thinking of uh, making a project in this area. With this, I'd like to conclude and I will invite uh, comments and questions. Thank you. Sir, uh, thank you so much, sir, for an excellent presentation. Uh, we, have, uh, we are getting questions uh, in the chat box. I have uh, noted down a few questions which uh, uh, would like to ask. Uh, is it okay, sir? Should I start asking? Please go on. Okay, sir. Yeah. So there's a question on uh, uh, a participant saying, I am working on anti-cancer medicinal plants. Which animal model is better for experimental process? Maybe he's asking a general, uh, you know, animal model for anti-cancer medicinal plants. Yes. You see, for anti-cancer screening, uh, uh, even if it is a... Um, plant product, uh, you might like to start off with the cell-based systems, right? Now, uh, there, are there are several uh, 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 cells are available, the cancer cells are available for screening. And in fact, the NIH has listed out around 60 or so cells, and that number of cells have been revised recently. Maybe you must look at the literature to reduce the number of cells which you would like to use for your screening. And if you know for what kind of cancer uh, this drug is uh, intended, then you can look at, choose your uh, cells for a screen, and you can start off with that. But you should also go with the idea that this will definitely, uh, th there are several issues in this. As I commented earlier, most of these cell lines have lost their characteristics compared to their original tumors. And so what you might have to do will be subsequently you will have to uh, you, will, you will have to uh, verify this, your results, going for in vivo models. For that, the patient-derived xenografts could be a very good uh, model because there you bring in uh, human characteristics or human genes and their, you know, pathology into this. Okay. Uh, so, uh, next question is, uh, one participant has asked, uh, there are, as you discussed about oncology and myocardial infarction, it has yes. so many failures. Why? Yes. Why there is so many failures? Yes, yes. Certainly. You see, the, the problem, as I said, the, uh, what you see in, let's say, in myocardial infarction, for instance, if you, if you see the, the, at the genetic level, at the gene level, what are the genes which are activated? What are the genes which are inhibited in animal versus humans? That kind of studies have not been done yet. In fact, those, those level of investigations will only validate your model. Maybe the model which we are using may not be relevant. I'll give you a very, very, very crude example. Uh, suppose you want to study, let us say, a drug for um, uh, myocardial infarction. Uh, there is a model of, let's say, dog. There's a model for pigs. But if you look at the, the uh, in, in the case of the uh, uh, pigs, they found that the reproducibility is much better than that of humans because of their vascular structure. On the other hand, if you want to study a drug which will uh, change the contractile activity of the heart, you might like to use a dog model than a pig model. Meaning these two species have completely both having cardiac function, but in one case, the vascularity is very different. In one case, the muscle, uh, cardiac muscle physiology is very different. So you might have to see what are the similarities between your model and your uh, the human condition. 
and maybe those kind of investigations have not yet been done but i'm sure people will do it in the days to come we will define the diseases at the genomic level not by simply at the phenotypic level now that is what will improve uh, the predictability uh, okay sir uh, this is another question uh, zebra fish is playing a vital role uh, since this participant is doing a marine bi marine biology and oceanography but is it equal as uh, equal to mouse that's what he's asking uh, whether it is as good as mouse model zebra fish model uh, i would say both are having a, a problem in the sense we will have to see whether how good is the translatability uh, from experimental stage to clinical stage the zebra fish is very very well suited if you want to screen a large number of compounds in a short time the resources are minimal okay and if you have if you want to so what you could do is initially you can start off with the zebra fish and you can reduce the number of molecules which are you know act you now if you have 100 molecules you can screen them and choose the best ones out of that then you can go for uh, the rodent based model so those kind of approach will be very efficient rather than trying to do everything on the rodent model which will be very expensive okay uh and uh, there is related to zebra fish uh, whether the immune system in zebra fish is uh, similar to mouse no okay no it's not see that is where the problem comes you see now you, for this kind of study one has to really look at uh, the uh, the immune components in the zebra fish versus the immune components in humans you have to compare i think or that comes first in the alphabetical order what Sorry, so this was... is one of my slides. We are using mouse for studies for so long, but there are very clear differences between mouse and man in terms of immunology. Okay, so yeah. like the toll-like receptor biology is completely different in 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 mouse, and so there are people who believe that all mouse immunology is totally useless. In fact, there are people who say you should never use use mouse for any study involving immunology unless you humanize the mouse with the uh, human immune system. um the if that is the case with a mammal i would expect the uh, uh, zebra fish is a, is a much lower uh, species will have a lot of issues related to uh, immune aspects okay so there was some research ethics uh, question uh, so research ethics has some limitation on using animal models uh, how they affect on our work like yes. they are asking on uh, ethical committee uh, okay. approving the animal models i think this is a very important thing all of us all of us should remember that everything which we do should be ethical and uh, we can always justify use of animals provided you could convince your ethics committee that what we are doing is is of relevant to uh, uh, human benefit you see what i'm saying that is yeah. point one point two would be you should also convince your ethics committee that whatever you are doing to this animal you always uh, taken a lot of uh, care to see that animal does not suffer unnecessarily for example there is a procedure or let's say placing a cannula or doing a uh, making a wound preparation for a, uh, on its body and so on are you using sufficient uh, level of uh, uh, anesthetic uh, precautions does the animal been protected from that sense so are you avoiding uh avoidable pain to this animal this kind of thing we have to convince not only convince the ethics committee you have to convince yourself that why not we do this in such a way the animals are not uh, subjected to unwanted pain so it's very essential for us to get ethical approval but before you present your case to ethical committee you should yourself be convinced of the uh, ethical aspect of your study okay so there is a question on mini pigs uh, what about mini pig model whether it is similar to human uh, and uh, there is a, how is the growth of mini pigs as animal model are they used in india and in which area of research you see the mini pig model is exactly i i had hardly any time to include all this in fact is a very vast area what we were whatever we were talking about today i only just touched upon one aspect of animal model the mini pig model is one of the very interesting model a very important model in several ways to begin with 
See, when you want to do any study on dogs, the dog lovers feel very offended. You know, those kind of you can avoid if you do it on many pigs. People don't really have that kind of an emotional attachment to their pets, right? Now, that's a very clear advantage, particularly suitable for India, I would say. Uh, the mini pig model has been shown to be very faithfully rep uh, replicating many human pathologies, including uh, pathology related to the uh, skin, for example. The d uh, dermal pathologies are very similar in between these two species. Like that, there are several areas where mini pigs are, uh, uh, are representative of uh, human condition. And the regulatory authorities are increasingly accepting mini pigs as a rodent for their um, long term toxicity study. So that's a big advantage, you know. So I would suggest that wherever possible, we can use mini pigs for a long term toxicity instead of dog, which has got several uh, issues. And they are very suitable, uh, they are very predictable. Okay. Uh... Uh, everyone is interested in animal models, xenograft models, and organoid models. Yes. Why, is it, why is it so that very few people are very few people are working on humanized animal chimeras? It's a very very interesting question, but the answer is very simple. These are all pretty expensive. You know, sometimes I keep wondering: Is it really worth to spend so much of money to do a study? You know, for example, the humanized model if you want to maintain. Uh, they are all immunocompromised animals to begin with. So you need to have a facility where you can keep these animals from all the um, contamination and inspections. And you maintain a very high standard of quality of maintenance. And so it's, it's, it's pretty expensive for you to do it. You know, And the technology involved also is not in the purview of many of us. Many of us don't have access to these dynamic technologies. You know, even if you want to import these models, they're pretty expensive unless it is supported by a by a drug program or a or a, a huge grant to, for a project. It's very difficult to use it, and that is why very few people are using them. You know, for example, if you see the Xenocraft model, the your lab animal condition should be fantastically clean and good because you are doing a virtually a transplantation. It is something your 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 surgical room should be better than a human uh, surgical rooms. It will be so well maintained, aseptic conditions, and so on. So that is why very few people are uh, able to do these studies. Okay, uh, we replaced rodents in our laboratory with zebra fish. Uh, it's a good model for toxicological research. What will be the scope for students working on zebra fish to get an opportunity in pharma industry of India? Well, sure. I think many many labs I know now they are having uh, zebra fish uh, as a model. Um, you can connect with them and definitely they can you know, work in collaborate. In fact, at this point, I would like to slightly digress from here and answer one important thing, that the academic institutions should collaborate with the industry. It's very essential. Uh, it gives you a lot of advantage in the sense that a lot of resources are available and academicians are in a much better position than industrial scientists in the sense. You can have a very free ranging way of thinking, very wild way of thinking. You are, you know, um, you can uh, bring in new hypotheses and so on and try to work on them in collaboration with the industry. That will be really uh, very uh, useful to the academic institutes as well as for the uh, for the industry. And in, hardly in, in our country, we have hardly any good relationship, partly because the academic institutions probably doesn't take the trouble of uh, probably finding a good collaborator. It's not easy to do it. It's a very, very tough job to do. I'm not saying it, it will happen tomorrow, but you'll have to work on it. Uh, yeah, uh, that's a really, uh, you know, very uh, great idea, sir. And I think institutions will definitely uh, look forward for the collaboration with the industry. Uh, then uh, there is a, uh, um, use of mice models may be challenging for some studies and what about large animal models to substitute mice models to overcome the problems? But the participant has not clearly specified for what kind of problem it is. He has generally asked, uh, uh, can we substitute mice model with a large animal model? See, the substitute, the main problem would be the maintenance. It is suppose it's easy for me to maintain 100 mice, 100 mice than 100 dogs. You know, state yeah. of a simple, simple problem, you know. And secondly, 
animals of uniform genetic background it's easy for me to get mice and rats you know with all the difficulties still we have it's still possible for uh, us to do that but that is not really possible with the dog it will become very expensive for you if you want to go for a beagle dogs and so on uh, you, we don't have a breeding center in the country you have to import them and so on so maintenance ease of you know um, uh, keeping them and uh, uh, working on large number of animals which is all problem when you want to use larger animals. Mouse is extremely well suited for uh, when you want to when you want to replicate your your results on on many uh, systems. Okay, so there was a specific question on nude mice. Uh, uh, one person has asked, sir, some nude mice tends to start growing hair. Mm -hmm. Experimental trial. Yes. Does hair growth is related to their immunity development? Yes, yes. In fact, if we see the nude mouse because of the genetic defect. They don't have the uh, hair follicles, and that's why they are new to begin with. But what we have seen is that occasional animal still uh, comes with a few sparsely distributed uh, hair follicles, uh, and people are not uh, able to associate that with a loss of uh, uh, immune deficiency. These animals are still immune deficient, but still some animals develop this. You know, is it okay. common? Oh, okay. Uh, and what is your opinion on replacing animal models with in vitro models, pros and cons? Absolutely. You see, uh, it's a very tough question, but there are a lot of advantages. You see, as I was telling in my, in my last slide, for example, these are the type of models for the future to come. In the future, you see, uh, let me uh, say that by an example. Suppose you are working on something, a drug, which works on the liver, okay? You can isolate hepatocytes. Earlier, what that's what we were doing. You can isolate hepatocytes and study them in vitro. Unfortunately, the hepatocytes are not alone in the liver. You know, there are several other cells associated with them. Some vascular cells, some uh, Kupfer cells, and you know, some uh, fibrotic cells, and so on. So this uh, 3D architecture, organoid chip or organoid things, try to put several cell groups together and form a small mass and study on them and that replaces uh, or that replicates what can happen in human. That is one aspect. The, the biggest task will be with the in vitro study directly going uh, for human study would be, we do not know anything about the metabolic pattern of this molecule. So for that you have to have a separate set of in vitro studies. Now, theoretically it is possible for you to work out everything on in vitro system and also including certain level of basic safety, and you can go to uh, clinical trial by phase zero clinical trial without animal model. But animal models we use in between as a as a uh, one step between the two. It gives you some idea about how this drug is being handled in a whole animal. You know that idea you can get before you go for uh, clinical studies uh, directly for in vitro. Okay. Uh, so, roles and reliability of Drosophila melanogaster fruit fly in cancer research. Do you have any comment on that? I have no idea at all. I know. I wish it, it would be a good model. You know, it's a, it, it makes a lot of sense. You see, one, one good thing which we have to appreciate is that earlier we used to say any animal which uh, is close to us evolutionarily is the best animal. Probably that is not really a good way of thinking because certain functions will be similar in man and your equivalent animal, depending on what kind of genes are involved in the two, what kind of a signaling pathways are involved in this function. You so this kind of a matter could be assumed. <clears throat> even a lower animal could be a good representative of human. Maybe those kind of things are possible with uh, uh, Drosophila. I have not worked in Drosophila. I wish I could you know, give some information. I have no idea. Okay, sir. Thank you. And uh, similarly, some participant has asked about the snails. Snails share 99% of the human DNA. I'm not sure. Uh, why can't it be tried as a model? <laughs> sure, you see, we can do that. See, there are there are a few fundamental uh, things which you have to remember. If you have snails, then can you can you propagate them so that you have genetically uniform snails that are available? You know, mm -hmm. that will be your first step. You just can't go and catch some snails in the pond and start working on them. You know, and you do not know what kind of diseases normally they carry. So you would like to uh, hold them in your colony free from diseases. So 
lot of fundamental basic ideas about its biology, about its upkeep and husbandry have to be worked out before you start working on uh, such animals. Okay, sir. There are the last couple of questions, sir. Uh, which model is best for kidney diseases? Uh, he has not specified what kind of I know diseases he is looking for, but generally the participant has asked which model is best for kidney diseases. No, unless you specify what kidney disease is. But uh, most of your kidney uh, problems, including uh, uh, the terminal uh, kidney illness, uh, there are very good models available right in the mouth itself. Okay. And uh, the last question, what is the reason behind of high mortality of more than 50 percentage in streptozootes in induced diabetic rat model, though we follow the standard protocols? Oh, you see, this is a, this is a very serious problem. Uh, a lot of techniques are, you know, very precisely should be involved. One thing is the way you inject your animals, one thing, and the way you keep your uh, streptozootes in their highly labile compounds, you would like to keep them carefully. We used to have mortalities in our case. Uh, uh, what you might have to do is, for your uh, collection of animals, maybe they are highly sensitive to streptozoxin. So before you go head on with uh, all your animals being treated, you might like to treat one or two animals to begin with and try to adjust your dose. See, whatever a textbook dose says is only a guideline. It need not be true for every colony. You might like to slightly modify that. You know, you might have to probably give a lesser dose and so on. And if there are mortality, you must quickly see what kind of sugar levels they had, how much time they survived and so on. So that kind of adjustment you have to do. One thing you have to always remember, what was written in a textbook, it may not be possible to reproduce in your lab because there are a lot of differences between lab to lab in terms of the animals used, in terms of the people who are involved, in terms of the technique which you use, everything could be slightly different and that can make a difference. Okay, uh, I think that's all uh, with the question, sir. Uh, sir, uh, can I ask one question, sir? Sir, can I ask one question? Yeah, sure. Please uh, go ahead. Please go ahead. Uh, sir, uh, one of the major problem you said that uh, the poorly designed uh, animal studies because the reliability is going to be very poor. So, to improve the study design as such, uh, what are the suggestions you would like to give from your experience, sir? Like. Uh, and especially, what is your uh, advice on the focal size calculation for animal health, animal studies? Because most of the uh, studies you should uh, see, they are not doing any sample size calculation related to animal studies. And CPCSCA guideline also not very clearly mentioning anything, how many animals you can use or uh, any such thing. So what is your uh, opinion on this? Okay. This is an interesting area. In fact, I used to talk on this uh, in different forum. Uh, you see, the research methodology is a big weakness in most of our institutions. We have to agree, you know. Uh, the, the habit of going to a biostatistician when you are planning the study does not take place. Invariably, you do a study, complete your study, take it to a statistician, tell him to make some story out of it. You know, that is the basic, uh, you know, problem many of us we have. So when you are planning your study based on the variable which you are what is your uh, end point which you are considering? All these things you will have to talk to a statistician first. You know that's a very important step. And I'm sure in every institution uh, doing biological research you have a biostatistician. If you don't have, we need appoint one, or at least have one consultant or somebody to come and give you you know advice on that. So this is very essential. The study design is very important. If you are having a parameter. Which is measuring, Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, uh, what I'm trying to say is, we hardly pay any attention to statistics. You know, there are many of our studies, are, as I mentioned in my slide, many studies are underpowered, meaning uh, the number of animals used in the study is so small, even if there was a difference, you would have missed it out. We call it the power of the study is poor. Now, it is becoming essential for you to estimate your sample size based on your study before you start your study. Because many journals now ask you now, what is your sample size? And you have, to, you have to explain to them how you decided on your sample size. So what I'm trying to say is, these are the statistical concepts which are very important, and we should discuss this with a statistician when you plan your study. Not at the end of the study, but at the beginning of the study. 
ओके थैंक यू सर थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक यू वेरी मच ओके सो आई आई वुड रिक्वेस्ट नाउ डॉक्टर डॉक्टर एम ठाकर तो हां डॉक्टर ठाकर विल मेक अ अनाउंसमेंट देन आई विल हैव अ फॉर्मल वर्ड ऑफ थैंक्स डॉक्टर ठाकर प्लीज यस सर या uh dr sankarna sir it was indeed very nice informative and doubt clearing presentation many of the questions have been also answered so i hope participants uh, are clear with the the doubts etc so thank you very much sir now dear participants thanks for your overwhelming response and for kind cooperation during this presentation as i told you in the beginning that the webinar will be a regular feature maybe on the second saturday and fourth saturday now the next uh, webinar will be on 11th july and our next speaker is very versatile dynamic and kind personality in our pharmacology and he was the previous president of the society he is none other than dr ak srivastava sir so all of you don't miss this opportunity it is simply to listen him is also an opportunity so so and the timing will be the same 11 to 12 30 most probably he has agreed upon to deliver the talk and uh, the topic will be declared in a day or two on the website or through the sms or the uh, uh, whatsapp or etc we will be informed about so be prepared to listen him particularly on that uh, 11th july thank you thank you very much dr bhav sir will propose the word of the thanks hey so you see before the word of thanks uh, okay. i would like to thank all the audience who listened patiently to the whole session i am very pleased that we had 260 plus Uh, participants is extremely you know impressive i am very happy thanks for your patience and thanks for raising lot of questions in fact um, my teacher used to tell me the presentation should be you could the discussion should be i think today i think i am very happy and i would like to thank the organizers like once again for having given me this opportunity i would like to also join your webinar as many times as possible thank you very much add you in our um, uh, system and uh, regularly will be informed thank you sir thank you my yes see who have worked uh, very hard dr srinivasan dr sriram dr ratnadeep and dr swatantra singh and we are highly thankful to our dynamic president dr thakur who has given the free hand to us the young team to work on and uh, we have excellent uh, uh, the team who has organized this webinar uh, but at last i am thankful to all the participants who have overwhelmingly they have pre registered we have a and uh, today this is the peak to 316 participants and uh, so we are uh, thankful to all the participants who have shown uh, a discipline and a, for a very uh, uh, say talk and a, a discipline manner we have completed this webinar so thank you each and everyone for making this webinar a grand success thank you all okay uh, so dr sinha dr sinha you just inform all that uh, any question is there on the um, email id the participant can again ask him uh, dr shankar narayan and as per his convenience he will reply right yes sir yeah Thank yeah. you. Uh, dear participants, please uh, fill the feedback form. So only those who fill the feedback form will get the E certificate, and E certificate will be mailed to you in a week's time. So please give us uh, at least seven days time to start sending you the E certificate. And uh, also, if you have any more queries, you can uh, directly mail to uh, the speaker, Dr. A. Sankar Narayan. His uh, email ID I have already shared in the chat box. So maybe you will uh, uh, you can send the questions to him directly. and thank you all thank you so much for your you know cooperation and uh, it was really a wonderful uh, presentation and a wonderful meeting all the participants uh, uh, i will look forward to have similar uh, webinars in futures regularly 
and probably more frequently also depends on your response thank you so much so i would like to now conclude the uh, meeting please allow me to end the meeting thank you thank you thank you bye yes yes with this we come to the end of this first webinar thank you all thank you my team thank you sir thank you